Hello. Um, today I'm going to discuss the role of environments in the development of artificial intelligence systems. And in particular, I would like to propose that maybe if we want to sculpt human-like AI systems, we should first focus on sculpting uh, their environments and in particular their social environments. If one observes the recent history of AI and the, the deep learning area in particular, what one observes is that research has been mostly organized and focused around developing new learning algorithms, new neural architectures, trying to understand what kind of architectural biases are needed for such or such capacities. A lot of efforts has also been put in uh, designing benchmarks uh, where environments here are seen as tools to evaluate and compare these learning algorithms. And because of this, the selection of these environments was based on criteria such as usability or speed, uh, but we have often had little detailed um, uh, details uh, about understanding the specific properties, the specific challenges that these environment pools, except for a few dimensions, for example, like sparsity of reward. So if you take the example of uh, Atari games, when people report results on 57 games, we don't really know what kinds of predictive, what kinds of reasoning, what kind of memory skills uh, these agents developed, because actually we don't really know what are the specific predictive or, or reasoning or, or whatever challenges of, of those games. And this perspective has been amplified by the objective of building uh, what, people, what some people call AGI, artificial general intelligence, that's taken uh, by, by part of the community. Uh, and in this context, since one wants to build machines that are universally good at all problems, this leads to considering the choice of the particular problems they are tested on as not really important. What, what matters is, is that they are quite diverse, but we don't look at which, which particular one they are. But in contrast, if one looks at biology, we see that biologists, when they try to explain the evolution of new capacities, detect an opposite perspective. Basically, they assume that the mechanism of learning at the phylogenetic scale is already there and is simple, so that's Darwinian selection. But then they, they wonder what were the environmental events, what were the environmental changes that led to the evolution of these or these capacities. So, for example, they study the Savannah hypothesis or the so-called pulse climate viability hypothesis when they want to explain the formation of, of some of the early cognitive and social, kill, social skills in a hominid evolution. Uh, so, in a way, the, the central causal factor they focus on is not so much the learning algorithm, but the environmental properties. Uh, and by the way, one can see the evolution of environments as a kind of curriculum learning at the phylogenetic scale. And to make this point even stronger, it's useful to think of what are the mechanisms that enable the shift from prehistoric uh, cognitive and social capabilities to modern socio-cognitive uh, capabilities in humans. And actually what's important to realize is that both have the same brain. So basically the same learning algorithm. Uh, indeed, there was not enough time for it to evolve. So if it's the same brain and the same body, what changed? Well, what changed is actually the sociocultural environment. Uh, early in their evolution, uh, the capacity for cultural transmission arised, and this had a profound ratcheting effect, with humans, for example, inventing fire, which opened niches uh, or time for chat discussion at night around a fire, which may have boosted capacities like theory of mind, like imagination, in turn leading to inventions such as writing, uh, which itself fostered institutions, new social norms, changing again the environment, creating new cultural niches um, that are constantly built and constructed by successive human generations. Uh, and finally leading to the things like mathematics, physics, and all with the same brain, but trained along a self-organized curriculum uh, of cultural learning. So an important part of this process is that many of these inventions are actually 
cognitive tools like writing or mathematics. Uh, they enable to extend the power of the, of the brain, not by bio, biological change, not by a change in the biological, biological architecture of the algorithm, but by internalization of thinking tools and, and of thinking architectures that were invented by others and that are learned by new generations. And cultural evolution did not only enable uh, invention of cognitive tools for thinking and, and, and learning better, but also it enabled invention of social tools like education and teaching, refining across cultural generations the techniques that lead to efficient transmissions of discoveries made by previous generations. So for example, today we know how to teach a 12 year old some mathematical concepts that require the greatest minds two millennium ago uh, for understanding them. So there is actually an emerging scientific domain called human behavioral ecology that studies how this kind of environmental dynamics at multiple scales, uh, from phy phylogenetic to cultural to ontogenetic scale, so how these uh, can shape the evolution of cognition, the evolution of intelligence. And by the way, there is this great paper uh, from Hélène Inizioti and Clément moulin frier which is making a short review uh, of this field and proposes a, a number of directions to leverage this perspective in artificial intelligence. I'm really recommending you to read that paper. So from this perspective, it seems the current focus of AI uh, on learning algorithms is maybe limited. We should extend uh, the range of activities we, we do by basically complementing it by an approach where one tries to sculpt AI by first sculpting and understanding their environments. So I'd like to describe a few small steps in this direction currently made in the AI community. So the first example has been work aiming to enable forms of generalization in reinforcement learning agents and robots. So first of all, one approach is to build a specific architectural biases such as, for example, work about modular neurosymbolic uh, systems. But another approach, uh, which is linked to my argument today, has been to work directly on environments, for example, by using domain randomization. So this has led to a very a, a number of impressive results, such as, for example, enabling simulated robots to learn complex manipulation skills in simulation that can directly transfer with, with a lot of success in physical robots. So that's impressive simulatorial um, application of, of domain randomization. However, a limit of these approaches is that randomization is really random. Like if we want to include different kinds of randomization corresponding to many different levels of difficulties of along different dimensions, maybe one needs to progressively adapt the distribution of randomized environment to the current skills of the learner. So we need a form of education. We need a form of automatic curriculum learning. <coughs> so let's see an example of, of work in this, in this direction. Uh, made in my team, in particular by uh, Remy Portelas, um, uh, which I am co-supervising with Katia Hausmann. So here it's about understanding how we can uh, have a deep reinforcement learning agent um, um, learn robust skills of locomotion. And actually, when I say one agent, actually what we really consider is not one agent, but we have a population of diverse agents using maybe different deep reinforcement learning algorithms which we may not know in advance, and also different bodies, like you might have bipedal, quadrupedal, different heights, different weights, different physical uh, constituents. And we'd like to be able to get each of those little individuals to the maximal of their potentiality. So basically, we want to provide them with good education. And so we are going to leverage procedural generation to generate environments uh, with a lot of diversity to train on them, but we're going to do this in a progressive manner. And so basically we, we are going to um, have some, some form of uh, teacher algorithm, which we call here ALPGMM, which is going to progressively learn a partitioning of the space of parameters of environments, uh, the one that are used by the procedural generations. And then, uh, for example, we can use Gaussian mixture models to, to group 
different uh, subparts of the environment. And for each of those subparts, we are going to estimate the learning progress, uh, the empirical uh, derivative of the performance in this particular zone of the space. And then we are going to use a principle for generating the curriculum, which is based on the concept of learning progress. So imagine, for example, you here on the right, there are four kinds of zones in the zone in the space of environments. Uh, three zones are difficult environments in, initially, a lot of errors. But if you train on them uh, for uh, the zone number two and the zone number three, there is progress with different rates. And there are other zones, zone number four, which is very easy and keeps easy. And one, number one, with the red one, which is very difficult initially and stays very difficult. And so the learning progress principle is basically that one is going to sample and propose environments to the learner with a probability that is proportional to its learning progress. So initially, we don't know, the teacher doesn't know in advance where he's making learning progress. So we will sample the different kind of environments uh, equally, but then you will discover there is one, the, the, the black one, which is providing more learning, learning progress. It will focus on that one. And when it reaches a plateau, which it, it will shift automatically to propose the second one while avoiding environments which are either too easy and already learned or those that are too difficult, maybe because the procedural generation proposes parameters that are outside the physical possibilities of this agent. And so, for example, using this system, we can see that on the, on the left, uh, uh, using this learning progress based uh, curriculum for controlling the evolution of environments proposed to the learner and enables to train agents that are very robust to a whole different kinds of environments. And if we consider the same space of environments, but instead of using uh, this automatic curriculum learning, we randomly sample in this environment, which is what we see on the right. Actually, we don't manage to get a system that learns robust and generalizable policies. And we can actually plot uh, the performances uh, in generalization for a, a set of test environments um, and compare the performances between auto automatic curriculum learning. So here, the, the blue, the, the green, and the orange one are three variations uh, of learning progress-based approach. And the, the, the gray one is actually random sampling of environment, which you see for uh, several kinds of agents uh, is considerably worse than automatic curriculum learning, not only in terms of the speed to reach the asymptote, but also with a lower asymptote. And actually also you see the purple one is some kind of oracle curriculum learning where human experts try to build by hand a curriculum. Sometimes it works better, but with a strange decrease in performance and sometimes it works worse. So in average, it's even better to do automatic curriculum learning. And okay, for those of you interested in this approach of working on teacher algorithm that learn to control the evolution of the distribution of environments that are provided to the learners, we've made a benchmark called Teach by Agent, which enable basically uh, to compare different automatic curriculum learning methods. So in this benchmark, there is, uh, we provide a number of agents with different low level deep RL learning algorithms, different morphologies, and then the teacher algorithms that our testees are supposed to control the evolution of environment proposed to them. And so here, a better algorithm is one that controls better the environment in order to teach in average uh, best to the whole set of students. And because actually this approach where you, you work on the environment does not make so many assumptions about what are the internals of the learning algorithms, we can also use that, uh, for example, for helping human children to learn better. So we've been using the exact same idea of trying to have algorithms that identify progressively the zones of learning progress for proposing uh, training exercises or training environments. We've applied it to the uh, train, uh, learning of mathematics in primary schools, uh, and we obtain extremely good results, uh, especially as compared to uh, uh, sequences of exercises designed by a, a human expert in the pedagogy of, math of mathematics but which cannot take into account all the particularities of all the students, either the one with facilities or the one with difficulties. And so we could get a higher diversity of children further uh, in uh, the levels if done, if we compare to a hand-defined curriculum. And we could also show that using this kind of 
automated curriculum not only enables more efficient learning, but also enables uh, to get motivation and intrinsic motivation higher in human learning, which is maybe even more important in the long term than um, if, uh, uh, short term learning efficiency. And uh, I'm, this is a project I'm really excited about because after this fundamental research uh, part of the project, we could now validate the, the, that the efficiency of the approach and it's now being transferred by educational company to a large scale um, software that will be distributed uh, large scale uh, in France uh, to uh, thousands of children. But actually those systems for uh, generating an automatic curriculum learning, they may not always be like outside, like, like for example, from the perspective of, of, of a teacher educating a learner, you can actually put them also uh, inside the head of an autotelic learner. So what's an autotelic learner? It's a learner like this robot here that has some internal mechanisms where that enable it to uh, represent and generate and sample its own goals, its own objectives, and decide when it wants to work on what for a certain uh, budget of time. And so here again, uh, these robots can use a learning progress-based mechanism. And so, for example, in that example, this robot initially is able to perceive all kinds of objects in the environment, including his hand, which is just an object like the others. And he's able also to imagine goals in terms of uh, trajectories that is uh, this object could do. He doesn't know what is feasible, what is not feasible. He is also perceiving objects that move by themselves uh, and that cannot be controlled in the environment. And he needs to take into a, to take a part learnable and non-learnable parts. And among the learnable parts, he is going to organize its goal sampling strategies by sampling the, the goals for which he is making a lot of competence progress, a lot of learning progress to control them. And so initially, it will be about moving the hand around. And then you will discover that a niche for making progress are moving these two joysticks. And actually, one of them is producing uh, a control, a movement in this uh, white electric toy on the left. And the white electric toy, in terms, becomes uh, useful for learning about how to move the, the little uh, white ball that you were saying. And so in a, in a few hours, like 12 to 15 hours, this robot that uses its own uh, uh, curriculum learning to sample and organize its own goals, we learn quite complicated skills, such as the one you, you see right now, like moving uh, the joystick to move the toy, to move the ball in very intricate, intricate ways. However, all those systems I presented so far, um, they, they show the importance of controlling the distribution of environments um, to enable efficient learning of generalizable skills, but these are all non-social skills. And if one is interested in building uh, artificial intelligence systems that have human-like intelligence, then as I was uh, mentioning at the beginning, we need really to look at the sociocultural dimensions of human environments. So as I was explaining, sociocultural dynamics have played a major role in sculpting human intelligence. And so we need to try to understand how to recreate aspects of those environments, uh, aspects of the evolution of those environments, and understand their role um, uh, in also in the development of cognitions. And as I'm going to explain in a few minutes, it's important to realize it's not only, uh, uh, for example, social tools are not only tools for having social interaction and, and communication. Some of them can be internalized and become cognitive tools, even for developing skills that are more individual. So let's see, at, at, at a let's look at a, a, a few first steps again in the literature, trying to go in that direction. So first of all, there has been a, a whole series of work uh, in the recent years trying to take this approach of, of uh, generating a diversity of environments uh, to try to build the agents that, that acquire robust policies, but environments which include other agents uh, with, whom, with, with whom the, the learning agent can interact. And typically those agents could be, could be actually similar learning agents producing some kind of competition sometimes or some kind of collaboration sometimes. Uh, and initially, uh, those agents 
will be in an environment where all of them will be relatively uh, poor uh, with poor skills, but as they train with each other, like each of them is constituting the environment of the other learner, uh, they will concurrently improve and this will form a kind of auto curriculum. Uh, it's a form of automatic curriculum where they will progressively together rise the level of challenge and difficulty to enable to do quite impressive things, such as, for example, in the recent uh, work uh, by the DeepMind team on open-ended learning that is combining both procedural generation, a bit like the, the examples I was mentioning uh, before, combined with the multi-agent setting, uh, enabling agents to learn to play uh, simple games. However, uh, even if this is very impressive work, if you look at the kind of social interactions that are uh, evolved uh, by these agents, they are still very simple. They are miles away from the kinds of social interaction we see in humans. And even from the social interaction we see in non-human primates, um, uh, maybe one uh, very good uh, source of information to, to, to realize the complexity of primate social cognition is if to look at the work of Michael Tomasello, I recommend to read his uh, latest book, Becoming Human, where he is identifying uh, in a very compelling manner some uh, social skills that, first of all, some of them are already shared with non-human primates and are very, very complex, much beyond what we can do with machines today, uh, related, for example, to understanding how to help others in a social context, uh, how to understand some uh, aspect of their theories of, of their minds that is related to, their, to the theory of minds. But even more importantly, Michael Tomasello uh, isolated and articulated a number of dimensions of uh, what he called uh, human, uniquely human cognitive capacities uh, that are especially related to sociality. So the ability, for example, uh, to have joint intentionality, to have groups of people that commit to a joint goal for a certain amount of time and are, and are aware that everyone is committing to the joint goal for this amount of time. There is the development uh, also of skills such as the understanding and use of fairness, the ability to do recursive inferences about what others know, about what I know, about what they know. Uh, and then uh, also families of skills related to the ability to build and to handle social norms, uh, to handle morality, to handle objective representation, like to understand that beyond the particular subjective representation that one can have and others can have, it is possible to build representation that take into account the diversity of representations available in the society and to manipulate this uh, in a way that put oneself uh, a bit in the periphery um, uh, to understand better how to organize and coordinate with others. So we really need to go towards environments with this complexity. And as a very small step in, step in this direction, I've been working uh, uh, with PhD students, including Gogo Kovac and Remy Portolas, again with Katia Hoffman, on trying to, to begin designing a set of environments that are going to include some of those more complicated social challenges. And so here the idea is that we don't have multi-agent that start with no social skills at all, but we are already putting in those environments uh, and social NPCs who have advanced social norms. They, are, they use uh, complicated forms of interaction protocols that new learner must learn. They have complicated kinds of preferences, habits. Uh, um, um, uh, and it's also important to understand the ways they, they, they express their intents to be able to read their intents and learning how to use their intents. Um, so that's preliminary work. We are working in this direction and you'll hear more in the, in, the, in, the, in the coming months. And finally, I'd like to conclude this presentation uh, by um, uh, uh, presenting very shortly recent work we've been doing around modeling um, this idea that Lev Vygotsky, a very famous psychologist put forward that language is not only a communication tool, but uh, is used uh, and is, is internalized and used for many other cognitive skills, uh, ranging from reasoning, imagination, planning, abstractions, making analogies. Uh, if we come back, for example, to autotelic agents, like the one you saw in the video a few minutes earlier, uh, 
here let's let's consider another autotelic robot. So this autotelic robot may try to um, uh, ex extend the range of the skills he may uh, he may have by imagining its own goals, trying to to build things with the, for example, with the kinds of toys he has in front of him. But if toys are complex, maybe the space of co the combinatorial space of goals he might consider may be very, very huge. And even if he's using learning progress as a heuristic to guide how to sample interesting goals, still it may be quite huge and it may lose a lot of time. Something that could be very helpful is to have a human social peer uh, next to this autotelic agent. And the social peer may provide guidance, uh, uh, for example, using descriptions, language descriptions of, for example, maybe the, 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 the robot is trying to do something and maybe the human looking at the robot says, oh, you've just grabbed the red U-cube. So he's providing those linguistic descriptions. And those linguistic descriptions may not be useful uh, um, only to learn how to communicate with, with the human, for example, learning uh, to explain what it has discovered. But they may also be internalized and used as a tool to further continue exploration even in an autonomous manner, because indeed language is transmitting, conveying a set of words that convey the concept that humans uh, find relevant, interesting uh, about the world. They are the result, words are the result of a cultural evolution process where humans have negotiated together what are the important concept and, the, and, and which concept we need to put a label on it so that it's going to be used as a basic building blocks in our communication and in our joint action in the world. And also the syntactic rules, they convey a number of quite important way, uh, tools to identify the, the dynamics, the compositional dynamics of the world. And so basically starting from this, uh, we've built the Imagine system, which is um, an autotelic deep reinforcement system, deep reinforcement learning system, where you have an agent in a Minecraft-like world in 2D, uh, which is going to leverage language learned with the social peer to imagine goals, uh, leveraging the, the compositionality of language to imagine goals that are outside the distribution of what is done so far, but still have a good probability of leading to learning uh, and extending the set of skills he knows. And we've been able to show in a number of experiments how it can boost uh, not only the generalization capabilities of language understanding, but really boost creative exploration. So I'm going to conclude here with two takeaways. First of all, it's important to realize that environment and the evolution of environment shapes the development of cognitive and social skills. Of course, in interaction with internal agent mechanisms, like the learning mechanisms. But AI at this point in time, I, I, I think has focused too much on understanding what are the right biases, the right learning mechanism. We need to focus just as much on understanding what kind of environments, what kind of evolution of environments, what kind of curriculum learning are needed to aim for certain skills. And in particular, if one aims to build human-like AI system that may interact with the human world, we need to design very rich human-like socio-cultural environments uh, to train those agents in. So thank you very much. If you're interested uh, um, in further discussion of those issues, there is a recent blog post uh, I've been sharing here. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, many of my collaborators, students, postdocs, engineers, uh, without whom none of the work we do would be possible. Thank you very much.